what I would do is basically talk maybe 10 minutes or so uh, to uh, not to necessarily summarize, but to uh, get a sense of uh, uh, the direction. <clears throat> One, I think the couple of introductory points which I thought uh, important uh, from the vantage point of this meeting is, for example, uh, one can think of the digital world or the digital space uh, primarily as an issue of domain or space and raise a lot of rights-based questions, whether, whether uh, what rights we have uh, for this, for that, and, and uh, rights against what, right to what. So you can really talk about, a great deal about that, you know, as, as a domain, as a space. The other is looking at existing rights and its connection with the digital processes or digital world. For example, um, will the right to information succeed as, as, as a right if uh, the government information is not truly available? the way uh, people want the information to be, to be available. Um, so there are many, many things that you can talk about. Many things can, have been talked about. You can talk about between the relationship between the digital world, digital world and the existing regime of rights in India or globally. So you can really talk about these two. There can be many more, but at least you can make that distinction between rights within that domain, uh, having a lot of connection with other domains, but at the same time, the impact of that domain on the existing regime of rights. Uh, all these three speakers are really pointing towards, particularly the first two speakers, about the distinction that we often make about rights as endowment and, and, and considering rights as purely as an exercise concept in the sense that you know, it's not important that you have rights, but it's important that you exercise rights. Of course, you can say that you cannot exercise rights if you don't have them. But I think the point is that you have uh, glaring instances where people are notionally have rights, but they're not in a position to exercise rights. I think in the much of the uh, rights discussion, much of the rights discussion in India and many parts of this world today is all about that disconnect between some people have some rights, but they're not able to exercise those rights, even though they have rights. You might say that uh, that particular way of having rights that is deeply problematic as well. But I think that discussion can also happen in terms of that distinction. The other thing is about uh, uh, the connection between various levels while we're thinking about rights. At least you can see uh, the way uh, Babu Matthew presented uh, about the right to life jurisprudence in India and said very categorically that, uh, that look, the quality of jurisprudence as far as Article 21 is concerned is way beyond what we have elsewhere, pointing towards a very local dynamic, a local reality, which, you can, which according to him is something that is uh, interesting, something that is positive, something that you can draw upon, something that is contributing or shaped by the existing struggles on the ground. But if you look at uh, what Kalani was presenting, was that a local dynamic is also sometimes driven by the larger global dynamic. You know, much of the women's movement and the international treaties and international regulations, international governance, uh, pushing the human rights, at least in the human rights, you could find the global agenda is somehow pushing the local in some sense. Uh, because some people might consider that the global is actually way ahead of local, at least in, 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 in the circumstances, in the cases that Kalyani was presenting. That much of the local laws uh, have to correspond to the larger universal standard uh, about, uh, about rights, about uh, uh, sources of exploitation, uh, sources of inequality, discrimination, and stuff like that. But in case of Abu Matthew, there are certain local dynamic which is actually way beyond uh, uh, which is actually going, running ahead of uh, 
what you find in the global jurisprudence about right to life. Three larger points about which I think are important is, is, is my own point of view that you know much of the um, victory of the rights uh, language uh, of course depends on the significant shift that happens in, in the way people look at society, people look at power, people look at um, ability to craft political society, the terms of uh, engagement with uh, collective life and so on. That's a fundamental shift that sustain our preoccupation with rights today. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is um, there is a larger impetus in our world, by and large, one can say, uh, to make rights juridical. Uh, if I be provocative, I would say to reduce rights to law. It has its own positive side, but it also has hugely negative side because often you find um, uh, sometimes it's almost saying that, look, you are almost reducing uh, rights to law like you are reducing justice to law. Sometimes law can be followed, but justice is not being done. Right? We have many instances where law is followed but justice is not being done. Or, in another way of putting it, is that justice or certain implications for equality is always an excess of law, always an excess of what you have enshrined juridically as your rights. That's one of the reasons why rights discourse are compelling and more important, not because we have rights in the Constitution, because the moral imaginary of rights actually go way beyond what we have enshrined. That's one of the reasons why you have always find people are using the language of rights not because they can only go to the court of law. Even when they cannot go to the court of law, they can, it can still provide as a huge moral resources, political resources to fight against tyranny, to fight against excesses, fight against um, uh, uh, discrimination, fight against inequalities, fight against and all kinds of things that we think are, um, are not acceptable. But having said that, much of the existing democracies, you know, against the democracy argument is, is a very powerful argument. But I think, I, I think, you know, one has to be a bit historically, um, uh, uh, I think I, I would be a bit nuanced in the sense that much of the defense for democracy today is also very two-sided, you know, as you know, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the long history of democracy, uh, the way it has been presented, 2,000 odd years, uh, you know, for almost mm. till end of the 19th century, democracy was not really used as something positive. It is only in 20th century that you find that democracy used as something very positive. Uh, democracy was never used as something very positive in, in much of its uh, history, except, uh, except a few points where you can find that people are using the language of democracy and stuff like that. Existing, all actually existing democracies today are fairly consistent with societies with riven by inequalities. All existing democracies can, can legitimately, can unproblematically thrive with a degree of economic, economic inequalities. A lot of excesses. A uh, lot of excesses of discrimination are not acceptable within democracies, but very few democracies today find, particularly when the socialist democracy opted out of the thing, when social democracy people think has been defeated, what you have on liberal model of democracy, democracy's definition, unless you, you, you contest that notion of democracy, unless you provide a very different kind of democracy, and that's one of the reasons why people think that the heart of the democracy, there is a chasm, there is a gap, on the one hand, you can have electoral democracy going on and people are voting and we feel very happy that so many people come and vote in the election. But at the same time, all your policy making and decision making, which has been pointed out in the case of water, in the case of cities, in the case of uh, many other things, are actually done by very few people. In other words, there is a, there is a, there is a gap between electoral democracy going on in some sense and the decision making actually has been taken by very few. And in fact, that's one of the disconnect between, uh, between what or people might say that, look, this is actually necessary to make this happen. And that's a cynical interpretation, but that's what really people are saying, that in the, in the neoliberal world today, uh, electoral democracy is necessary for making a lot of decision making 
arbitrary. You know, it's possible. And that's what is the real world of democracy is all about today. I think we have a lot of questions about, uh, about rights, about society, uh, what kind of society, what kind of social changes are necessary to make rights real? Uh, um, what is the way in which we, uh, we can think about uh, uh, you know, rights connecting to uh, what I, I think I, I agree with um, uh, Babu in that case, in the sense that the right to life, not Article 21, but I think the primacy of life, which actually goes way beyond uh, what the Article 21, in fact, the jurisprudence, in some sense, uneasily catching up with a larger moral sense of life, or primacy of life. You know, that's the reason why, because the jurisprudence is trying to imitate that, therefore that jurisprudence appears to be progressive and interesting. Because what is actually important is the primacy of life. And that, I think, is extremely important. I think I'm sure that uh, you would have a lot of questions. I'm sure that um, the speakers would like to take some questions, comments. Um, and then we have 15 more minutes. Uh, and uh, you can also uh, try to connect what they said with what you are doing or what you are thinking of, because after all, it's a huge subject and a very complicated uh, subject. I think uh, I'm sure that you have a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, so I will stop here and uh, please raise your hands. I'm going to look around and call you uh, in the in the way I see your hands. Yes, please. <laughs>